Thank you for joining us today. Educators all over the world are rapidly transitioning to learning online and some for the first time. AWS and Amazon put together a webinar series for educators by educators who have expertise in online learning. Today, we have Michael Soltis, who is professor and chair of computer science at California State University at Channel Islands. He's going to talk about teaching online, 10 suggestions for success. Before we get started, know that you are muted, but we wanna hear from you. Please use the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel to communicate with us. We'll answer your questions as we go along and also have time at the end scheduled for questions. Now, I would like to introduce Michael Soltis. Uh, thank you, Grant, uh, for that introduction and for having me here. As Grant said, I am Michael Soltis. I'm a professor and chair of computer science at California State University Channel Islands. And um, uh, my, my interests are in algorithms and cybersecurity and, of course, in cloud computing. Uh, you can keep uh, in touch with me, send me any um, question you have by email and uh, both my email and my uh, web page are given on this slide here. So let's start with uh, our um, webinar. Uh, I am going to give you uh, 10 points for success in online teaching. And uh, right here is point number one, that online teaching is the new normal. At CSU CI, California State University Channel Islands, we have gone online many times. Over the last five or six years, we have had uh, wildfires uh, two or three times. Uh, there have been, unfortunately, shootings as well, and the campus was closed, and now we have COVID-19. So, in a sense, uh, teaching online is a new normal, and it is a good thing, as you will see in, in this webinar. Um, it's a good thing for many reasons. So, it is it is a good time to create online versions for all your classes. And uh, in the future, if there is another emergency, um, you, you will be able to quickly uh, move in, in this direction. Also, you have to keep in mind that many students at this time, especially the uh, uh, non-standard students, people who, who do not come to university right after high school work, and have other obligations, family obligations, and many of them prefer um, online teaching or at least a combination, a hybrid between in-class and online. So it, it's a way of responding to emergencies, but it is also a way of responding to many students who prefer uh, to be taught in an online fashion or a blended fashion at least. Second point is that as, as you're moving to teaching online, you should uh, expect two uh, initial shifts. So these are big shifts uh, from what you were doing before teaching in the classroom. The first shift is a pedagogical shift to online teaching. And the second is the shift to using a different set of tools. Now the pedagogical shift is big in that in class you're used to uh, a certain interaction with the students. As you know, so much of human communication is nonverbal. You're able to see students' faces and expressions and postures, and there is an easier dialogue, people raising their hand, everybody participating, or some people participating in a discussion. You may not have those things in the online setting, or you may have to simulate them. And in fact, you, you, in, in, some, in, in some ways, uh, the simulation of that environment in the online fashion can turn out to be more productive, um, as, as you will see in a future slide. The second shift is the shift uh, in tools. Um, before, maybe you were using Canvas, but now suddenly you're in a situation where you have to use perhaps Zoom or Chime um, for classroom time and for breakout sessions and for office hours, uh, some collaborative tools such as Slack on top of Canvas where you can have a record of all the interactions and a forum of discussion for the students. And um, in, in our case, we have Piazza as well and My IT Labs. And of course, you know, if you're teaching in computer science or similar areas, business and communication, you will be using 
uh, you may be using AWS Educate tools as well, and you may have to rely on them more heavily as you move into the online setting. So you need to invest uh, time in learning those tools, and that doesn't mean an hour before your first class. That means spending a good week or two. Our university administration realized this, and before our shift to online learning, uh, we were given two weeks. Luckily, one of those weeks was our March break, but the other week, we si simply stopped instruction and everybody was encouraged and coached in moving online. And you may have to rethink certain things, for example, accessibility. Um, and, 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 and that is something that you have to examine uh, based on the type of students you have in your class and, uh, and reestablish accessibility principles for your online version. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into those two shifts. Point three is the pedagogical shift. As we've said before, a lot of nonverbal communication is lost, and now you have to compensate for it in some other way. For example, in my case and many other instructors, we use Slack. We have a dedicated uh, Slack channel, and uh, students uh, use it as a forum, and I use it both to uh, discuss things with students, to, uh, to announce things, to post uh, papers, PDFs, uh, videos. Now, you may think that this is slowing you down. I, I think, au contraire, it's actually not a bad thing to have it, even if you're teaching in the classroom. I find that Slack or some collaborative tools such as Slack, Canvas has very good discussions uh, that work just as well, and Microsoft Teams as well. Um, it's actually, it, it, it's very helpful in the classroom. And it is helpful because it turns out that when students have to write down their questions, they sit down and they concentrate and they have to articulate it more carefully and very often as they write things down, uh, they crystallize and become more clear in their own heads and the answer is generated from that process. Um, so it's, uh, you know, having, having that type of uh, written communication channel is conducive uh, in some sense to concentration on, on, on the student's part. And also as, as answers are arrived at either through simply posing the question and then having the answer or having other students pitch in with possible answers or having me as instructor moderating getting to the answer. That whole process is nicely archived and you have a history of it and then you can go back and you can see how things were arrived at. If you're a student and you weren't paying attention when this was going on, you can go back and you can revisit it. And it's very helpful to have it. Now, the, the final thing here in this point three is vi video conferencing tools. I mentioned uh, Zoom and Chime, uh, excellent tools. Some people use simpler tools such as Skype and even FaceTime, but uh, but but you have to you have to think about how you're going to create engagement. Um, you you should not think of it as using Zoom to simulate an in-class experience online. It's a different type of entity, and you have you should be using um, the the features in Zoom, such as uh, uh, discussion forums and breakout rooms, and uh, and, and 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 the chat. To, uh, to build a new kind of experience where people are engaged and, uh, and, and part of the conversation, not just you uh, presenting a lecture, because you yourself will become frustrated since it may seem as you're simply speaking into a screen. Point four, a uh, shift to new tools. So beside the shift in the pedagogical style, you're going to shift to new tools. And this is both for faculty and for students. And um, in, in our case, we are computer science. So for us, this is seamless and very natural. We already use many of these tools and our students are capable of, uh, of, of jumping on them and, and simply deploying them. But I understand that this may be difficult in, in other fields and other areas uh, where students don't have so much IT savvy. So, 
you have to be patient. You have to learn the tool yourself and you have to provide good tutorials to the students on how to use the tools. You have to think of a way of introducing those tools, perhaps one by one, rather than all of them at the same time and slowly coaching students in best practicing in using them. A danger here is that as you are uh, getting to know these tools and getting to learn them and becoming excited about the features, you can make your class about the tools rather than the material that you're presenting. And the role of the tools is always auxiliary to the mission of the course as a whole. So you have to keep that in mind. And I think the, the way to accomplish uh, avoiding uh, this pitfall is to explain the proper usage of the tools and to automate as much of it as possible. Here I can give a very quick example based on uh, my AWS experience. One of the classes we have um, lifted online is our computer architecture and uh, assembly programming. COMP 262, where students have to write assembly language, so their computer level instruction language uh, in, for different architectures. So what we did here is we created AMIs based on uh, different architectures that you can launch and provide them to the students. So they don't have to launch them themselves. They don't have to configure them th themselves. They get the entity and they just work on the part that is relevant to the course. Point five, uh, you have to be creative. Um, what I mean by this is that more material can be uh, transported into the online setting than you may think possible, and it can be done so successfully, and more successfully than you may expect. I'll give you an example. Another class that we lifted into the online setting in, the, in this COVID-19 emergency is our senior robotics class, COM 470, where, uh, st where students work in a very hands-on way. It's a, it's a class where you build things and then you compete and collaborate. And it's very much an in-lab experience. And we were thinking, how can we possibly recreate this environment online. And it turns out that it can be done quite nicely. And for that, we use the AWS Educate uh, uh, RoboMaker uh, class. And uh, we are thinking in the future of in incorporating into it uh, uh, Deep Racer, uh, which can be purchased uh, on Amazon for $300, a, uh, a robot, and they can be given to students. In any case, they take those devices home and they work on them still hands-on by themselves in this case, but the whole experience can then be brought into an online forum because they can compete and they can test what they have built in a virtual environment where they see other people's creations and other people's uh, robo uh, maker uh, solutions and deep racer cars performing. And um, in a way, it, 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 it is able to re recreate the hands-on experience at home, but also it is able to recreate that communal experience of testing um, your solution against other students' solutions. Point six, I've mentioned this before, but it is important to think of online teaching not as a simulation of in-class teaching. Uh, and you're, the, an approach here may be, okay, I rather prefer to be in the classroom and I myself love being in the classroom. I like the, you know, the electric atmosphere of a classroom and the questions and the, the students and getting to know them as people and very often becoming friends. I like that social aspect of teaching very much. But it is important to think of online teaching not as a second best in lieu of uh, being in the classroom, it's a beast of its own, and it has its own advantages and disadvantages. And approaching online teaching as a simulation of in-classroom is not the right way to do it. The right way is to concentrate on the advantages. So, uh, for example, um, use 
whatever web conference tool you're using, Zoom or Chime or something else, uh, to create an, an interactive environment. One way to do it is incorporating online quizzes into your lecture. And there are good technologies there, such as Kahoot and quizzes with uh, three Zs there, um, and breakout rooms. And students like the type of competition. In fact, the first time I saw quizzes, I think, was at uh, the um, reInvent Las Vegas conference last December. I was attending a workshop in preparation for certification in uh, the security specialty, the AWS security specialty, and the instructor used it and it was very effective. So what happens is that everybody gets the quiz on their device, whether a phone or an iPad or, a com or, or their laptop, and everybody participates. Everybody gives themselves an alias that is then seen on the big screen by the entire class. And you can see as people are answering questions uh, successfully that they're kind of rising to the top in a leaderboard ranking that everybody can see. And, it, and it, it's fun and it's interactive and it's very easy to recreate that experience um, online. Point seven, you have to change how you do your grading. Um, your grading has to be done differently. And I think the principles here are to rely more on assignments than, um, uh, than tests, midterms, and exams, um, either individual or group assignments. And here you have the same control over people doing their work as you do in an in-class setting because people take the problem home and they work on it. And you hope that they do their work and you hope that the team is working well, not just one person. So you really have exactly the same difficulties, but you're not at a disadvantage by having gone online. You can use Canvas Turnitin as you can do when you're using Canvas in an in-class setting. And if you do want to give testing exams, which I still do, what I do is I limit them to being multiple choice and I give uh, specific time limits to each question, a minute and a half or two minutes, because I simply do not want this to become a competition in who can Google search faster the right answer. Okay. And if you limit the time and people need to spend some time to, to, to read the question and then 10 seconds to think about it and choose the right answer, their ability to let's put it bluntly, cheat in that context is really diminished. Point eight, I think, I think you have to do a lot better in the online setting is the structure of the class. And what I mean by that is that you have to have your class very well organized and very well structured, much better than uh, an in-classroom setting simply because you can informally update people and remind and have a conversation and run into people and tell them something. You can communicate a lot in an informal way, which is very difficult to do in, in, in the online setting. You can still use Slack to post things and reminders, but it is very important to communicate frequently, repetitively, and completely what you want accomplished. And you want to structure your students' week uh, very precisely. So these are the modules they have to read. These are the videos they have to watch. Th these are the uh, knowledge checks they have to perform. This is the lab they have to complete. It's the only way because it's very easy for a student in an online setting to kind of drift away because that energy that you find in the, in the classroom and the social aspect can be missing, right? So structure. Point nine, it's very important, just as in the in-classroom setting, to project enjoyment and passion, but perhaps even more important here. I've already mentioned the pitfall of not presenting online teaching as the second best, given the circumstances, but I really wish we were all in the classroom. No, you have to reassure the students that this is an online class and you're going to do very well, okay? So you want to communicate that you are enjoying this material, that you have passion for it, that you have enthusiasm for it, for what you're teaching. Reassure the students that the time spent with you and the hard material you're presenting to them is a worthy pursuit. 
So they feel that there is a good reason to be there and to pay attention and to invest themselves in it. And that at the end of the class, you know, they will possess treasures that you are giving away here. In a, in a kind of dry bureaucratic way, we call it the SLOs, the student learning outcomes, right? But really they're going to possess secret knowledge and treasures that you're going to give to them. And they, in order to get there and achieve it, they have to, to journey with you and they have to be engaged and invested and in their top game. So it's really important to communicate that, to give to to give people that that push, you know, uh, that that they need to do well in the class. And also, you can present to the students that this online class is really an opportunity for them because the job market is moving very much to online collaboration. Right? Uh, people have teams consisting of people all over the world. They meet constantly on Zoom. I mean, people working in the workforce. And having a class where you learn to work in that environment, to thrive, to be accountable to yourself and to others is a really good preparation for that reality that students will encounter in the marketplace. And then the last point, point 10 is perhaps uh, you can think of it as a bonus point for those of you who are teaching computer science, but it applies to everybody else as well, that sometimes online is better. And I can give you two very brief examples where I find that teaching in an online fashion, so mostly online, perhaps with a few meetings in person if you want to, works very well. So one of them is I teach a programming class where I use Cloud9 and I find that the online setting is the right setting for it. Uh, Cloud9 allows me to create the same IDE, integrated development environment for all my students. And all my students can access it with a minimal uh, computer. What I mean by it, as long as they have Wi-Fi and Chrome or some, some other web browser, they will have the same experience. Furthermore, I can, very exactly build their environment so I know exactly what's in there and I don't have the problem I have in classroom where people are sitting in front of different computers that may have slightly different uh, specs and therefore not everything is working exactly the same way. Having Cloud9 uh, pre-established by me adds this homogeneity to the class and to their experience and that everybody sees and experiences the same way and it's a lot easier for me as an instructor to give the right feedback. A second class that I'm actually looking forward tremendously to teaching this summer, I thought it before, um, it's a class on web development and I, I am using AWS for this class and I'm teaching students everything from load balancing to auto scaling to uh, spinning up instances to installing WordPress and even communication aspects. Um, how do you communicate uh, online effectively the message of your company? And uh, that class simply works very, very well online as well. And it again prepares students for the experience they will have if they do this type of work outside in the industry. Okay, so these are my 10 points. Um, I hope that you will find them valuable. And if you want to start somewhere, I would suggest the following next steps for you. So first of all, pick two of the tools that I've uh, um, listed here and just learn to use them. I think Zoom, Slack would be a very good beginning, but there is also Microsoft Teams if that's what your company has or your school. Um, you can try, uh, you know, some, some, something else. Pick, pick two tools and see how it goes. Canvas. Number two, deliver a trial class using them. Record yourself and play it back. Uh, you will learn a lot by doing that. I have learned what my mistakes are when I teach online. A mistake that is very easy to make is to give students less time to respond because you don't have that uh, physical interaction, you're not seeing them think, you're thinking that either they're not thinking or they don't know the answer, and you have a tendency when you pose a question on Zoom to jump 
with the answer right away if in three seconds you don't hear somebody. But keep in mind that people need to think about your question, understand it, then they need to think about a possible answer, and then they need to articulate it in their head before they say it to, in the public forum. So give people a little bit more time. And I've learned that I do that by watching myself uh, lecture, uh, playing it back and seeing what I do right and where I need improvement. And the third point here is to design the project for students that fits well in the online setting, in the online context, okay? So either a knowledge check quiz that they can all do using cahoots or quizzes where there is a leaderboard and they see how everybody else is doing, or if your class requires more writing, have them write a blog post, uh, or have them record a two-minute video presentation and post it um, somewhere. But think of a nice assignment that fits well in the context of online teaching. So pick two tools, deliver a trial class, and then give yourself feedback. And three, design a project that fits well online. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was really interesting. We appreciate hearing your perspective and best practices for a move to online instruction. And remember, if you have any questions, please ask through the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. If we don't get to your question or you want to dive deeper, you can register for office hours by going to the link on the screen. You can also find and register for more of these webinars about transitioning to online learning by going to the link on the screen. I've also put that link in chat. Know that new webinar topics and dates are added daily. Hey, Michael, we have a question that I would um, wonder if you could help answer. Sarah Bishop asks, asked, do students usually re respond better to work being put up in small parts daily, or is it better to provide work for a longer time frame? What are your thoughts on that, Michael? So that depends a little bit on the class you have. Um, what is certainly important is for for the work that is given to the students to be very well structured. So I think it is best if the student knows what they have to do on Monday, what they have to do on Tuesday, what they have to do on Wednesday. The, the time frame I work with is a week. Um, I find that the week is long enough so that people can catch up if, if they're unable to do work on a particular day, but not too long so they don't get behind. So I like to work with a week. Awesome, thanks for that. We've had several questions come in around K-12 and how do you engage like five to 12 year old students? Um, some folks have asked about kindergarten and actually we have a webinar um, next week uh, led by a K-12 instructor and it's uh, tips for K-12 instruction. So I encourage you to um, sign up for that one and we will be talking specifically about that age group. Um, Michael, are you still there? I can see some folks have asked about the purpose of a breakout room. You mentioned breakout rooms. What is that concept and how do you use it? Yeah, so I, I, I typed a very short answer about it. It's a feature in Zoom I really like. Um, what you need to do when you're teaching online is to break the rhythm of a routine. So if, say you have an hour and a half, um, for example, currently I am teaching a Cloud Foundations class on Mondays from 6 till 7.30, and it's an hour and a half. So I teach in the following cycles lecture for about 10 to 15 minutes, get one or two key concepts in that time, and then have an activity. So the activity can be a test, or it can be a quiz, or it can be a question, and very often it's a break uh, room. So what is that? Well, you can divide your entire class online into little groups, say of three or four or five students, as many as you like, and then you assign each group a discussion topic and they select a leader. And then at the end of their discussion, then you give them five minutes or six minutes, you don't make it too long, uh, you don't make it too short so that they can be productive, but they don't end up sitting and doing nothing. And then at the end of their session, what they do is they inform the, the rest of the class about the outcome of the discussion. And there can be different discussion topics or it can be the same discussion, so that the different groups from the different breakout rooms can compare notes. Fantastic, thank you. Michael, um, you talked about, and I love how you talked about 
don't think about online learning as second best, but think about it as a great opportunity to um, share and treasures with your students. And, and another term that I loved, someone asked, um, what are the advantages of online learning? I think that there are many advantages of online learning. And the first two that come very quickly to mind is that as, as educators in, in the universities, in colleges, in community colleges, we're seeing more and more uh, students who are not your classical student who is coming to school following high school. We see a lot of people who have been working in some industry for five to ten years and then they decide they really like computers they've been working in IT or or something similar and they want to come back and they want to get an education and these people very often have families and obligations and jobs and it's difficult for them to follow the standard schedule uh, Monday class at 10 a.m. they cannot do that they're at work but they we still want to serve those students so the solution for them is online teaching. And online doesn't mean you never meet. You can have a hybrid uh, solution, just like you can have a hybrid cloud, right? You can have some stuff in the cloud and some stuff you can have it on premises and it's it's a mixture, it's both. So one, one advantage is the fact that we can reach a population of students who also uh, want to learn. And the second, advantage um, I would say is that more and more people find out that in their jobs they have to work at home um, and uh, like we're doing right now for example here and you need to develop certain skills to be able to do that you have to have the discipline uh, the time management skills you have to have accountability to your company and yourself and you have to be productive and very often you um, you you work uh, by yourself uh, for many hours. And I, I find that by teaching online, we get many students in that mode where they're ready uh, in a knowledge-based economy, which is our economy, to take one of the many jobs that do not require coming into an office. Maybe there really isn't even an office. So I would say those two uh, top advantages, there are others. Great, thank you. A lot of folks are asking the question, and I, Michael, this is, I'm not gonna put you on the spot here, um, asking a question, what is the best tool? And you know, that's a tough question to answer for a lot of reasons. One, because there are so many different tools that we use um, in remote learning, whether it be a learning management system or um, a screen capture screen, sharing tool, um, a quiz tool. Michael talked about several different quiz tools. So there's not one best. Um, and when it comes to web conferencing, um, Michael mentioned Zoom and there's um, or Amazon Chime and GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar and so many different uh, web conferencing tools. And you know, the question is, which is the best one? Well, it really depends. It depends on what's best for your institution. Um, we we don't advocate for a specific um, web, web conferencing tool. It's something that you need to talk about with your own institution. And some folks have asked about security of tools and um, recent news articles about one tool or another. Um, again, those are questions that you need to address with your IT folks, the IT folks at your school, and and do what's best for your own institution. Okay, Michael, I have another question for you. And this is a really good one from Sarah. Bishop, there's been a lot of talk about the transition online meaning transition online meaning that we have to move more slowly than that we will not and cannot expect to get through as much content. Um, so the transition being slow, is this accurate or should we set our expectations higher? And and I'm guessing, Sarah, you're asking, should we move quickly and be able to um, expect that we can transition immediately? Mark, what are your thoughts on that? I think that you can cover the same amount of content. Um, it's the, the, the content that you can cover is not necessarily a function of the modality of teaching. And content is only one parameter. Um, sometimes you don't cover a lot of content, but the things you cover, you cover in a lot of depth and students can profit from that. Um, I'm not sure a course needs to be comprehensive to be successful. Uh, some of the best classes I have taken as a, as a student were really focused on one thing, and they've gone uh, deep in that. 
I would say the difference between online teaching and in-classroom teaching is the um, the maturity expectation of the students. So students have to have a slightly higher level of maturity in order to do well online. For once, they need to have uh, very good work habits. Uh, when you come to a classroom and you have a kind of, you know, personal, physical contact with uh, your peers and your instructor, that can uh, motivate you uh, more easily and can um, and can can pull you to, to, toward learning. Whereas if you're at home, especially uh, these times when we're at home and isolated on top of that, you have to have this self-starting mechanism that is really a mark of the more mature student. So I would say that the difference is that online online teaching puts uh, a little bit more uh, on, on, on the shoulders of the student. Thank you, it makes perfect sense. What about synchronous versus asynchronous? What's a good split? Or um, what's a good mix of synchronous and asynchronous in a specific class? Right, uh, very good question. Um, I think a mixture of both. You, you have to be careful if you're teaching in a synchronous manner um, not to uh, teach a class where you are kind of, you know, covering the slides uh, for uh, for a given slot of time. So you meet once, twice, or three times a week, and you cover the slides. You're going to be losing students very quickly, especially if you record your lectures. They will think to themselves, I can listen to that at some other time. So if you, if I, I think a good mixture of both, uh, but when you do have a meeting um, that is synchronous and and students show up, you have to be. This has to be engaging. Uh, they there has to be a dialogue. It has to be um, it has to be interesting. It has to be well planned. You can deliver some of the, or lack of a better word, a little bit more this material. Um, in an asynchronous manner, say you can you can record yourself explaining some topic that is uh, a little bit more difficult to grasp and uh, takes uh, te more technicality, and then students can go through that. They can stop it at times when it becomes difficult, rewind, and then when you meet synchronously, you can cover the details and answer questions. And, and there is a nice rhythm if you do it that way. So asynchronous uh, presentation of something and then a synchronous discussion of it. That's a good cycle. Almost the flipped class, flipped classroom that we've been talking about for several years. Now we're kind of forced to do it. Thank you again for coming. Everyone have a great day.